Who's your emergency contact? Who should we notify in the case of death? Welcome to the USP, where I've spent the last two plus decades of my life. As you know, I'm an ex-felon, so obviously I can't vote. I know there's some states that says felons can vote and this and that, but I haven't really seen anything that lead me to believe that if I do vote, my vote will count. And hopefully that changes, but for right now, I'm just an observer. You know, I enjoy politics. I follow them, both sides of the aisle, Democrats, Republican, conservative, liberal. I have my opinions. I have my thoughts on them. But for this episode, I'm not going to really get into the, the left or the right. But I just want to discuss the ideology. When I say, you know, with politics, it's the same as religion. It's the same as gangs. All these different entities serve one purpose. And that purpose is to divide. You know, obviously, I haven't been out here in the world for the last quarter of a century. You know, it's a long time, my whole adult life. So I haven't been able to observe things the way they are out here. The only way I get my news of the world is through the television. But while I was in the penitentiary, I read a lot of books. You know, through the course of my bid, I probably read over 3,000 books. I wish I had a better memory, like a photographic memory that I can recite and give you guys titles and authors of all these different books and subjects I've read. But, but they're there somewhere, you know. When a topic comes up and we discuss things, I'm able to recall the information that I've read. But just to freely just say this and that on certain things, I'm not very confident that I'm able to. But that being said, I just want to give you my perspective why I say religion, politics, and gangs are the same, and why they're all designed to divide. And with division comes conquer. The people in, in power knows that to keep us separated keeps them safe. While we're busy looking at each other, while we're busy dealing with grievance that we have with each other, while we're busy saying that we're right and they're wrong, they're able to be in a safe space to be able to continue to manipulate us in whatever way they, they want. You know, when it comes to religion, you have one Bible. Just even just in the Christian religion, but you have so many different sects. You have Catholic, you have Mormons, you have Baptists, Protestants, Jehovah Witness, and a dozen other ones. Then you have Buddhism. Then you have, um, you know, the Hindu. And, of course, the old Viking Thor and Odin and all the rest. And then you have, with, in Greece, you have Zeus. And everybody that subscribes to these religions is going to swear up and down that they're the true religion. And everybody is going to believe that they're the chosen one. And if you're not part of their religion, they look at you as an outcast. Growing up Mormon, I see it a lot. You know, these people that believe that they're Christians, believe that they follow, you know, Christ's example, which from my understanding of Christ's example is pure love, acceptance. But either the people that are most critical of other people, most judgmental of other people. 
and they're quick to say that they're the true religion and you're worshiping a false god and a false idol. When you speak to Christians and you try to get them to understand that a lot of things that were placed in the Bible were plagiarized by older, by older texts from the Emerald Tablets, from the Sumerian transcripts, but I'm not here to discuss whether they're right or wrong, or whether religion is true, or anything like that. I mean, I can take you through the history of Christianity, and it's a very bloody history. But that's the same thing with Islam. It's a very bloody history. It's still a bloody history. My focus for today is that <clears throat> All these things create a separation between us. Now, when you move from religion to politics, it does the same thing. Whether you're on the left or the right, you're going to feel that you're right and they're wrong, and it keeps a divide. The same thing with gangs. You're from that hood, I'm from that hood, you're from the other side of the street. I don't even know you, but I'm conditioned to hate you because of whatever, because if you're wearing the wrong color or you're the, you're the wrong color. But the thing that we don't stop to think is that why are these things in place? Why that the people that created these entities <clears throat> want the separation? At the end of the day, it boils down to control and money. Religion is big money. <clears throat> the Mormon church out here is one of the richest church in the world. The Catholic church, you know, just from <clears throat> all the tithings, contributions, I'm pretty sure their wealth is in the uppers of billions of dollars. <clears throat> the same thing with every religion. You see these preachers, <clears throat> pastors, on a podium talking about <clears throat> your salvation. And then they ask you for some money, right? You know, from my understanding of um, the Bible during Jesus' time, he walked around in robes and sandals, didn't own any worldly possessions. But you have these pastors, I think there's a show um, out of L.A. or something about these celebrity pastors or preachers or whatever they are. They're riding around in Rolls Royce, private jets, living in mansions <laughs> off of your sinful ways. Because you're giving them their money because you think that these people are your salvation. Because you really think these people can speak to God and save your soul. In the Bible, it says, it's not verbatim, but God is everywhere. You don't need to go to another person to confess your sin. You don't need to go to another person to speak to God on your behalf. You can speak to that entity directly. They tell you that in one breath, but then at the same breath, they say, oh, come through us because we're the gatekeepers. Same thing with religion. <clears throat> you know, our political climate is, um, is boiling up. It's coming to a head. You know, because you have people from both sides of the idol looking at each other, the other side, as the enemy. Not understanding that we all live here. That this country is for all of us. And not thinking to try to make this country work for all of us, but to try to keep it separated. Your side are crazy, your side are racist, your side is a lunatic, and, and all the rest. But again, it goes back to two things, control and money. 
Look how much money is pouring into these campaigns. Just not from the corporation, not just from the elite, not just from all the oligarchs and the rich, but from average citizens. You know, I'm not here. I'm not like, again, I can't vote. And <clears throat> I disagree with a lot of things from both sides of the aisle. And there's some things that I do agree with. But without getting too political, I do have to say that I have my own core beliefs. And one of the things that I've seen trending that I feel that is creating a big divide is these politicians that are trying to make things that are not normal, normal. Trying to loot people's identity and gender. I watch a lot of news, so I see a lot of things about <clears throat> these guys that claim to be girls and are entering girls' sports and are demolishing the competition. You know, they just had uh, <clears throat> the Olympics where this girl got her brains beat out by another boxer that identifies as a girl, but is really a male. You have uh, Liam Thomas, who, when he was competing <clears throat> with the men, he was in like the low 500s. But now he's breaking records and all sorts of stuff. The issue I have with that and I really do have a strong issue with that, is that <clears throat> anybody with common sense can understand that there's a difference between male and female as far as strength, you know, all the physical aspects of it. That's why we have Title IX, to separate boys and girls' sports so that the girls, your daughter, your sister, <clears throat> can enjoy a level playing field competition with other girls. And there's girls that have been working their whole lives trying to get scholarships, trying to move up to whatever, make a living off of it. And now they're being usurped by dudes that are claiming to be girls. Listen, I don't have a problem with how you want to live your life. You want to wear a dress, you want to wear makeup, you want to get some hormones, you want to grow some breasts. That's all good and daddy, that's more power to you. I have friends that are transgender. I might not agree with that they're really a girl trapped in a guy's body, but as a human being, I respect them. One of my wife's best friend is a transgender, and she's a good person. There's a guy that used to be can't, uh, I don't want to say his name, and is now trying to be a girl. <clears throat> but it makes him happy, it makes her happy, and she's a good person. And she's just trying to live her best life. I have a brother that is gay. He's married to his partner. They have a daughter and both of them are beautiful people. The difference between them and the ones I have issues with is that they're trying to live their life. They're surrounding themselves with the people that care about them. Where some of the others are insisting that you conform to their craziness, all their terminology. You know, I, I'm not sh pronouns. But with that, I have a really big issue with them pushing that kid stuff on 
kids. You know, everybody understands, everybody's been a kid. At two years old, what can you really know? At four years old, at six years old. Hell, some of us didn't even realize who we were and, or even comfortable in our own skin until we were teenagers. So where does it make any sense to implement these policies for these young kids? Well, <clears throat> my belief is that the reason that there's political ent entities that are pushing this policy so hard is because they do want to break up the norm, break up the family structure. They don't want you raising your kids. They want you the kids to be raised by the state. They don't even want you having kids. Why? Because if you're having kids, then you're going to be stuck at home taking care of your kids instead of in the workforce. So all this at the end of the day has nothing to do with equality or equity or rights or privileges. It all has to do with money. It all has to do with control. It all has to do with separation. There's big money in all these medications, these hormones, these supplements that they're trying to push on you. There's big money in these surgeries that they are trying to perform on you, whether that's cutting off your weenie or making you one. And the people that push these agenda do not really care about the individual, do not really care about your psyche. They care about their agenda. They care about the money that you're going to fork out to pay for all these things. Whether that money comes directly from you or whether that money is federally funded or state funded, the people that perform these procedures, the people that issue out these medications, they're filling their pocket up with that money. So it behooves them, it's self-serving for them to push that. But the rest of us, we don't stop to think about that. We just get into the aspect of, oh, that's wrong, or that's right, or the rest of it, which serves their purpose of divide and conquer. <clears throat> when it comes to gangs, it's the same thing. You know, when I was growing up out here, when I was running in the streets, our mentality was like, we're that gang. And we didn't respect the other crews or whatever, because we thought they were fake, or we thought they were soft, or whatever. <clears throat> you know, out here it was a competition to, for us, for me, you know, I didn't hustle. I wasn't selling anything. You know, all my crimes were all robberies and, um, and shootings. And we we're just out here trying to outdo the other. But, you know, when you're hanging out, when you're with a crew, your homies don't want you hanging out with the other crew. Why? Because they might think they're afraid that you might start liking the dude, start respecting the other crew, and start hanging out with them more than they, more than you hang out with us. And then maybe that might cause you to switch sides and so on. At the end of the day, there's an agenda behind it, behind the leaders of these organizations. They recruit and it's a form of manipulation and brainwash to think that you're the shit and they're the enemy. Because now within the control, <clears throat> they can dictate what you do. You can, they can use you to help push their narcotics or commit whatever it is that they're doing that 
makes them some money. So going back to religion is the same thing. When you subscribe to a certain religion, they don't want you reading other texts, other content from other sources. Everything that is not what they give you, everything they haven't approved for you to read, must be of the devil, must be false. What they do that is because they don't want you to, really, to read other content, other texts, and then maybe come to the conclusion that maybe this religion over here makes a little more sense. Or maybe this religion over here kind of lies more with my belief. And then now you're going to jump ship. You're going to become Christian instead of Buddhist or Buddhist instead of Christian or Islam and all the rest of it. So they drill into you that they are the true religion and that everything else is false. That everything else is of the devil. He misleads you. And we are so quick to buy into that. And for generations, like, they don't need to keep drilling that to us because what they have able to do is brainwash our parents. And now our parents or our grandparents are doing the bidding for them. Whether that's religion, whether that's politics, or whether that's gangs. There's gangs out here. You know, you got, <clears throat> I told you uh, about my friend Goldie. You know, his dad was Big Goldie. He was Goldie, or Young Goldie, or Baby Goldie, or Little Goldie, or Tiny Goldie. Like, it's just passed down generation after generation after generation. Because at the end of the day, whatever gang you from, whether you a Crip, Blood, GD, Vice Lord, Latin Kings. What is it really? A Sereno, a Norteño? You're not born these things. You become these things depending on the neighborhood you live in, depending on the state you live in, depending on what region, what part of the country you come from. But these things keep you separated. And I can speak on these things because out here on the streets, we're separated. We beef with each other. We try to kill each other. But then when we go into the penitentiary and are forced to have some type of laws and some type of rules that we abide by so that we can coexist for the most part so that we don't end up chopping each other up and spending most of our time locked down in the shoe, we get the opportunity to move around and get to know each other and then develop a respect for each other and then even start caring for each other. I've seen it with my eyes. I've seen it with my own eyes. You know, the Bloods and the Crips, they beef on the streets, but they have an alliance in a penitentiary. All the different black gangs out of California at one time or another are at each other, shooting each other, killing each other. Crips on Crips, Bloods on Bloods. But in the penitentiary, they have a coalition, the California Alliance, the West Coast Alliance. Same thing with the GDs, the Vice Lords and the Land Kings. If anybody knows, GDs and Latin Kings do not get along. They kill each other on the streets. Vice Lords, they align themselves more with the Latin Kings than the GDs. But in a penitentiary, they have a coalition. That extends to the Midwest Coalition. And they function with each other. And through that function, 
they develop a respect and even care for each other and even come together when it's time to battle somebody else. Same thing with the Asians. I'm Cambodian. But out here in the streets in the 90s, I'm beefing with the Vietnamese. And different part of the country, like here in Utah, the Laos and the Cambodians get along and we beef with the Vietnamese. But when you go down to San Diego, the Cambodian and the Vietnamese get along and they beef with the Laos. So we're all separating ourselves. We all hate each other. So we don't even know the reason because our parents back in the homeland were at war with these different countries, with Laos, with Cambodia. So they passed that prejudice down to us, us here in America. We automatically just pick it up because we hear it in our household. Oh, don't trust the Vietnamese. Oh, don't trust the Laos. And I'm sure in the Vietnamese household, they're saying the same thing about the Cambodians or about the Chinese or the Koreans. So the continuing to pass down that bias, that separation, that hatred. But when I went to the penitentiary, we all sat at the same table. Vietnamese, Laos, Chinese, Koreans, Samoans, Tongans, Hawaiians, and everybody else under the sun that fell under that fell under the Asian Islander car. And through the course of that time, if somebody's deserving my respect, I gave it to them. And if somebody is deserving my love, I gave it to them. And now I have lifelong friendships with people from all these different races, from all these different gangs, from all parts of the country and even around the world. But if I never had an opportunity to look at these individuals as men, if I never had the opportunity to see how they conduct themselves and, that's, and realize that their core values align with mine, I would always continue to be carrying that bias and that hatred. But that's the thing about the politics and the religions and these gangs. They don't want you to have an opportunity to sit down with people that don't look like you, people from the other side of the streets where you get to know them and maybe come to respect them and even care for them. They want you in your box because it serves them a purpose. And my message for this video, man, I know I got a, went out a little here and there, but it's just, We got to wake up and stop falling for this bullshit. Everything we do out here feeds the machine. Whether it's donating to the politics, whether it's donating to the church, or running around putting in work for the hood. There's somebody within these different entities that are benefiting from our labor, that are benefiting from our tears and our sweat. If you believe in something, man, believe in it. Believe in it enough, stand up for it, even die for it. But believe in it because you believe in it, not because somebody else is telling you that you should believe in it. And me, I don't want to die for things that I have no idea about, that I don't know anything about. And you know, when I put on my life, when I put my life on the line, I want it to be for the right reason. But so many of us throw our livelihood away over somebody else's words. We live in the age of information. We have moved from the industrial age to the age of information, meaning that every knowledge that exists out there on this earth, we have access to. 
if you are passionate about a subject, if you're passionate about politics, if you're passionate about religion, do your research. Find out the truth about all these things before you align yourself with them, before you give up your life for them. Because not one of them is giving up their life for you. They expect us all to be good little soldiers to do as we're told. They expect you to be a fanatic while they sit in the back room and send you on all these missions. I've never respected leaders that sat in the back. I respect the leaders that lead ahead of the pack. And all my life, through things that I've done, I've always been on the front line. I've always been the point of the spear. And I believe that that is the reason that I have the respect that I have, I have the love that I have. Because I've never been one of them dudes to sit back and send somebody else to do something that I myself wasn't willing to do. But you have a lot of these people out here that pretend to be leaders, that are quick to ask you to go do something while they stay home safe. Ask you to be out there in the trenches while they're safe behind their securities and their walls. And for me, man, I love, I love people. I believe that there's more goodness in people than bad. And I get frustrated that when I see these good people blindly following something. If you believe in something and you can defend it without repeating the rhetoric, that you can defend it with your own logical thoughts and reasoning, then who am I to say anything? You know, I told you, like, I tell my homies in there, if you believe in something enough that you're going to put your life on the line, me as a friend, I'm going to stand with you. But don't put me at risk because of my loyalty to you over some bullshit. And I'm not talking about if I think you're right or you're wrong. I'm talking about if you really believe in the cause, who am I to say nay? If you really believe it, if you really care about this person, or if you really care about this issue, and there's 10 dudes coming at you, but you're standing on it, homie, I'm going to stand right with you, right there with you. And nobody has ever met me can say anything different. I've never walked away from a friend. Not when I was out here in the streets, not any of my time in a penitentiary. And my homeboy could be dead wrong. But he, if he believes in it, and he feels that he's willing to give his life up for it, put his life on the line for it, as a friend, I'm going to stand with you. Of course, once the smoke clear and we survive, then of course I'm going to check you. But you have a lot of people that play on your loyalty, play on your love, and they take advantage of that and they manipulate that. And to those people, I don't have anything to say because those are the crud balls. You can't, you know, that's who they are. But for the rest of us that are loyal soldiers, man, don't allow somebody else to put you in a trick bag. Welcome to the USP.